What would it be like if Evangel University had never existed? It might not have if O'Reilly General Hospital had not provided the foundation for the institution known today as Evangel University. On November 7, 1941, O'Reilly General Hospital opened its doors just in time. The attack on Pearl Harbor unavoidably forced the United States into World War II, creating thousands of human casualties and even more wounded as a result. O'Reilly General Hospital played an integral part in the treatment of over 50,000 of these wounded men during the nearly five-year course of the hospital's existence. Many were flown directly from overseas battlefields in North Africa, Europe, and the Pacific to receive treatment. The 165-acre hospital had a total of nearly 4,000 beds. 6,000 men and women working around the clock were required to treat the patients, meeting their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Springfield, Missouri won in an eight-state competition for the Army's new 7th Corps Area General Hospital. The government bought the site for the price of just one dollar from the Springfield Chamber of Commerce. I arrived in 1942 after medical basic in Little Rock, Arkansas. Before I got assigned to a unit, they selected me as an instructor in the surgical technician school and I ended up staying at the hospital. After a couple of years in the technician school, I ended up being assigned to the medical clinic there. A good deal of my time was spent supervising the students and the ward attendants, which meant that I walked up and down the corridors of this institution almost daily. Over 50,000 patients, not all at once, of course, but that's, that's big. There were 4,000 beds, and today we would consider that a hospital with 1,000 beds was as very, very large. Well, there were 4,000 beds here and they were full. O'Reilly was a plastic and orthopedic center. We had burn patients who required plastic surgery. We had amputees. We had quadriplegics. Many of the blind came here. Oh, just any kind of plastic surgery you could think of, making new noses, new ears, prosthetics. One man, for example, had one of his ears burned off, and they, the doctors at O'Reilly restored the ears so you couldn't tell unless you looked really closely. It was not uncommon to see a boy with his arm outstretched in a cast, with the pedicle growing from his abdomen up his body and changing positions from month to month to reconstruct his facial features. I had a hand wound. My whole hand was just blown all to pieces by German shrapnel, the whole center out of it, and it took a lot of grafting and ligament work. I was sent here to a doctor who specialized in those things up to O'Reilly here. I got here the 4th day of July 1945, was discharged the 20th of January 1946. Although some patients lost their lives due to grave injuries, others were able to persevere and find encouragement and those around them. Private First Class Joe Topping was gravely wounded while fighting on Guadalcanal. A Japanese machine gun caused Topping to be paralyzed from the waist down. He weighed a scarce 60 pounds when he arrived at O'Reilly five months later. By cold medical standards, there was little hope for him to leave O'Reilly alive. However, doctors and nurses noticed that Joe Topping wore a grin, and he had a magnificent courage. That courage cultivated might keep him alive. Nurses looked up Joe Topping's record and found that he would soon be turning 21. So Joe's medical friends at O'Reilly got busy with plans for a birthday party, told the town about it, and in came a landslide of birthday cards and presents. With a handsome birthday cake from a nearby mess hall, they gathered around Joe Topping's bed in a hospital ward and gave him a rousing reception on his 21st birthday. Without encouragement and hope, Joe might not have survived the next 60 days. Late in July, he left O'Reilly 
amazingly better. General Foster wanted the hospital to be known as an institution with a soul. And I think everybody was trying to make the patients feel as comfortable as possible. One old gentleman at O'Reilly knew he was going to die, and he had not been baptized. My husband was a Christian and knew the Lord, but of course he wasn't a licensed minister. My husband tried to get in contact with someone a licensed to baptize him. The old gentleman kept begging to be baptized. He was Church of Christ and believed that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. My husband went into the bathroom, filled the bathtub, and took the old gentleman in and baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The old gentleman came up with such a smile on his face and was so happy. He did go to meet the Lord that night. When it was a veterans hospital, that there were not nearly as many patients as when it had been an army hospital. There were over there were about 600 and some beds there compared to almost 4,000 when it was an army hospital. But it was still op operating. They got mostly tuberculosis. Uh, patients. Built as a temporary facility, O'Reilly Hospital stayed open until one year after the war ended. The Reverend Bert Webb and his wife Charlotte remembered well the days in 1946 when the fate of O'Reilly Hospital hung in the balance. During that time, Reverend Ralph M. Riggs and the Webbs met on the corner of Glenstone Avenue and Division Street in Springfield, Missouri, and prayed that the Lord would give the property to the Assemblies of God for evangel. We stood on that corner in front of that O'Reilly Recreation Building, and we prayed right there, the three of us. We looked over to those barracks and those buildings. The Holy Spirit just seemed to come into our hearts then and gave us an assurance that was the place. The Assemblies of God went on to acquire 58 acres of the hospital's property free of charge to establish the first liberal arts school. Evangel College was founded in 1955 and utilized many of the hospital's original barracks. The school has since acquired 22 more acres, become a university, and made substantial external changes. Orion people say they like Springfield where they find people like the 80-year-old gentleman who walked across the city to take private first-class Joe Topping a present, a Bible.